We're still in the book of Hebrews. All right, so we're in the book of Hebrews. Uh, we're in Hebrews chapter 4. If you have a Bible, you can meet me in Hebrews chapter 4. We're only going to be in two verses today. Because um, w- what happens here in verses 12 and 13, it's, it's quite interesting. It's, like, uh, it's almost like uh, the writer of Hebrews was, was writing about uh, some really great things. This is how Jesus is greater than all these different things. A- and then he kind of like, it's like he stops for a moment. He's like, I'd like to talk a little bit about the word of God. Uh, and he only does that in two verses. And then he transitions. And then from uh, Hebrews chapter 4, uh, verse uh, 14, all the way to uh, verse uh, chapter 10 verse 8, it's like, you know, he's talking about Jesus as the high priest. Like, he transitions. It's kind of weird. It's like, it's, it's weird. It's this weird, these two verses, and it's like, okay, well, how do we make sense of this, and how is all of this connected? And, and it is. My hope uh, this morning is to make that connection. Uh, and so Hebrews uh, chapter 4, verses 12 to 13, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read it uh, to us, uh, and then I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for you, else that you pray for me, uh, that God would do uh, that which only he can do, and that is save many. Hear these words of our Father. For the word of God is living and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit and joints and marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. No creature is hidden from him, but all things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your word. Uh, We ask that you would make it plain to us this morning, uh, that we would uh, see you for who you are through your word. I pray that you would remove any distractions here this morning. I pray against the evil one whose desires are to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus, you come to give life and to give it to the full, and so we experience that life through you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, would you lead? We love you. We praise you. We need you. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen. Now, last week we looked at the importance of entering God's rest. Uh, Let me quickly summarize for those who weren't here. The priority is to enter God's rest. That is a priority for the children of God. To receive salvation and peace and joy and confidence of eternal life and the forgiveness of sins. If that is to happen... We must believe God, trust God, hope in God, and look away from all our efforts to pay the penalty for our sins and to rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ. We must enter his rest. However, to believe and trust God, we must first hear his word. We must hear the good news. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 2 tells us this. We must understand the promises that he has made to anyone who will repent and believe. To repent and believe. To repent simply means to turn away from whatever it is that you are pursuing, hoping to find life and meaning in, and then to turn to Jesus to turn to Jesus, to repent, and then to believe Jesus, to believe he is who he says he is and has accomplished what he says he has. Faith is only possible when the word of God's good news is made known. Finally, we must be diligent. Otherwise, we will give in to temptation and find ourselves drifting away and neglecting what God has proclaimed and provided for us. I've basically summarized where we've been from Hebrews 1 all the way to where we are now. Now, having said all of this, I believe we're now prepared to look at what the author of Hebrews has to say about God's Word, what it is and what it does. And so what exactly is the word of God? Well, the the primary reference is to the spoken word, the message, the good news that he mentioned back in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2. I've already mentioned this. The word of promise and provision that the Exodus generation of Israel rejected and refused to believe. 
It was the word that the church in the first century heard from God concerning the urgency of paying attention to what they had been taught. And for us today, it is the written word of God, the scriptures that contain God's revelation and promises to us. That is his word. The bottom line is this. The word of God is whatever form of communication or revelation we receive from God that calls for a response of faith and obedience. Let me say that to you again. The word of God is whatever form of communication or revelation we receive from God that calls for a response of faith and obedience. That means that if we just study this from cover to cover and do nothing that it tells us to do, then we are just academics. But also, if we say we do everything that God calls us to do, but it is not anchored in his word, then that's demonic. Happy birthday to me. <laughs> now, now you, might, you might be sitting there going, Yo, on a, the first one, sure. The second one, that's a little bit too much. But, but hang on, let me try to unpack it this way. The, the, the academic piece, look, we could study this and know everything about it, but if we do nothing it tells us to do, then we are treating it like just another academic piece of work. Is there history in here? Absolutely. Is there literature in here? Absolutely. Narratives, yes, but it's more than that. And we'll see that in a moment. It's more than that. We cannot just be academics, biblical scholars. We've got to be more. But if we say, no, 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 I do everything that God calls me to do. But zero foundation in his word, then that means that you are the one who is in charge of how we are meant to act and live and engage with one another. You are, in a sense, creating your own religion with you who seated at the throne of this tiny little religion that has no power. You have started a cult. Is that not what cults do? They do all these things in the name of God, but when you search the scriptures, you're like, it's not there. Where did you get that from? Your own imagination. You've created a God of your own imagination instead of God of revelation. That is why it is demonic. And we must call it what it is. Far too many people are led astray because of it. The word of God is whatever form of communication or revelation we receive from God that calls for a response of faith and obedience. Hear me, Richard Fellowship, if you want to give me a, uh, a, a birthday present, here it is. Surrender your life to Jesus. That is the greatest birthday gift that you will ever give. If you are not a Christian, you know that you have not given your life to Jesus. My, my, my prayer, I'm pleading with you that you would surrender your life to Jesus. Now you might go, oh, now I've already done that. Great. Praise Jesus. Then would you read his word? That, that's, my, that's my birthday request. You say you're a Christian, great. Read his word. You want to know about God? It's here. You want to know what to do? It's here. Read the word. Now you might go, oh, now I'm a Christian and I read his word, then will you please do what he says? Yeah. Please, would you just do what he says? Does he say make disciples? Then go make disciples. Yeah. Does he say serve? Then serve. Does he say get plugged into community? Then get plugged into community. Does he say give generously? Then give generously. Just do what he says. Greatest birthday gift you'll ever give me. If not, then just, then just keep it. Keep it. What, what, is, what is it about 
this word that is so important? I mean, why, why, why so intense? Huh? On your birthday, no, like why so intense? What, what is it about this word of God? Why is it so important? What does it do? What does it accomplish? Why is it so crucial that we must listen to it and respond to it? I'm glad you asked. The answer can be found in what I've kind of unpacked as the, the five characteristics of the word of God that we find in these two verses. Now look, I know I know that, that there's probably more than five characteristics, or there could be less than five characteristics. We're going to walk through them, and then you're going to go, why does two sound like four? Look, I'm, I just, I've just unpacked these two verses. I literally could have just taught it as one thing, but I'm trying to break it down, right, a and give you five. You know, for those who have a Baptist or Anglican background, right, so some hangers that you can have, five things. It's like, yes, I'm ready now. Five things, one, two, three, the space for, to write them. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about you, but don't worry. Right for my charismatic brothers and sisters, I'm going to throw some things at you, and it's going to come at you and be like, "What? Where did that come from?" So I'm thinking about you as well, right? Uh, the joy of a transcultural community. But before we do that, let us never forget what the scriptures say, what God says. That that this this text is divine speech. Yeah. It's divine speech. Second Timothy three sixteen says. All of scripture is God breathed. And it is profitable for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness. First Thessalonians 2 verse 13 it says, when you received the word of God, this is Paul writing to the church in, in Thessalonica, he says, when you received the word of God that you heard from us, you welcomed it not as human message, but as it truly is the word of God, which also works effectively in you who believe. This is, not, this is not our stuff. It's not. Now, now I get it. It's, it's been written over years, but by different people in different times and different cultures. And, and so the temptation is to go, no, th those, are, those are man's words. But, but God is sovereign over all of them. All of them. And so it's his word spoken to, to, to us so that we might be able to, to, to continue to share it with others. And so having said that, let me give you the first of the five characteristics of the word of God. Number one, the word of God is living. The word of God is, is living. We often treat the word of God as, as old and ancient words. And they are. They are. But they are very much alive. They are not dead. The, the, the Bible may be paper and ink bound together by leather. However, please don't just stop there. The word of God is living. Yeah. Living because... They are God's words. And God lives. God's word takes on God's own characteristics. It's not like a newspaper that you read today and then discover tomorrow that that information is outdated and is of no benefit. It is also living because it is the instrument God uses to impart life to us. In other words, the Bible is the living word of God primarily because of what it does. Yeah. Peter put it this way, the apostle Peter. He says, you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. James echoes Peter's words when he says this. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of God. Not by our own will, but by his divine and sovereign will, were we born again. And that by the word of truth. God's word is alive. And, and I think sometimes we, we tend to treat it like it's dead. And so we need to then breathe life into it. Let's be honest. 
And here's, and here's, how, here's how we do it. Like, I know, I know we, we, we mean well. I know that. I know we mean well, but, but, but that can be dangerous. You do that for an extended period of time, it can be dangerous. Let me, let me explain. So, so here's what we do. We'll get into like co- community groups and city, uh, city groups and, and, and Bible studies. And, and I've heard it. In fact, even I've said it, and I've done this a few times. Like, like we'll read the scriptures, right? And then, and then we'll ask the question, so, 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 so what do you think it means? Like, what does it mean for you? Like, how do you feel, right, after reading that? Like, like, like what do you think? Like, what, what does it mean for you? Not, like, it's well meaning, because look, well meaning because I want to hear what you think. Your, your feelings matter. God gave us a brain. God gave us emotions. So those things matter. So, so, so it's well-meaning. Like it's, I get it. I get what we're trying to do. But, but here's the problem. At some point, we've got to say, but here's what it says. Like, I, I, I want to I hear, hear what you think and what you feel. All of that matters. But if you stop there, then you are the final authority. Your feelings become the final authority. What you think becomes the final authority. And, and, the, and the thing is, the further away you get from God's word, like, like it's well-meaning here, right? Like, like I'll say it and I know what I mean, and then I'll, like, I'll navigate and lead the group well, and then maybe the person after me, like, okay, I, I was close enough to honor, so I understand what he means when he asks that question. But, but the further and further and further and further away you get, people are now just going, so what do you feel? It's whatever you feel. Are are there things that are challenging to understand in God's word? Yes. Are are there things that that like we wrestle with that we're like, I don't, I don't know. And we'll say stuff like, yeah, but you know, Jesus lived in a different time. That's why like, we don't, we don't, you know what? Here's how I would apply it. Here's how I would say it. Here's the thing. God didn't ask you. He, he, just, he just didn't. He didn't ask you. He goes, here's my word. Respond in faith. Why? Because I know what's best for you. I created you. I have a plan for you. A purpose for you. But when we feel that we need to breathe life into God's word, it's because we don't believe that God is who he says he is. <laughs> Let me, as one who uh, spends a significant amount of my time interpreting God's word, seeking to understand it, this matters. And it should matter to you as if you say that you've crossed the line of faith and you read the scriptures and you want to do what God calls you to do, that it should matter to you. Be a Berean. Yeah. Listen to what I'm saying and then go home and then open up God's word and study it yourself and go, is it true what Ones said? And if I'm wrong, then come and tell me. Come and correct me. If, if, I, if I write a letter to my wife full of love and passion and just all the amazing things that we have together, and she reads it and she loves it, and it's incredible, and she weeps. It happens every, every day, every day in our house. We weeps. And, and, then, and then, you know, she puts it away and she's like, I want to save this one day. I want my not just my kids, but our grandkids and our great-grandkids and like five generations down the line, like for them to one day pick this up and go, wow, and then they read it. And then they go, here's, here's what I think Oni was saying. Yeah, this is what he was saying. Like, I, like there's a part of me that I'd be like, that's, no, no, that's not, that's not what I meant. Like I, like, I think, I think, like James and, 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 and Paul and, 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 like they're all going, hold, hold on, hold on. That's not what I said. I, like, I can imagine James. I mean, James is super... Like, like other guys, you're like, Oof, I wonder what that means. Like, okay, Peter's taking us back to the Old Testament, so we need to understand the Old Testament. Okay, what does that mean? Oh, Hebrews, wow, what do you say? Like, James is just like, you know what? I'm just going to make it plain. Faith without works is dead. I don't know what that means. Like, what, you know? Like, what do you feel when you... Faith... Like, he's like, I can't make it more clearer. Faith without works is dead. Work it backwards. Am I dead? Where are my works? I guess I don't have faith. He's trying to make it plain. And here we are going, well, you know, James lived in a very, he didn't even have electricity, so maybe that's not what he meant. What he meant was that the word of God is living. 
It doesn't need us to try to breathe life into it. Friends, why, why, why am I so passionate about God's word? Why, why do I want to be faithful in preaching God's word? Why do I hold the Bible with such high regard? Why, why here at Rooted Fellowship do we preach? We preach from God's word. Almost line by line. And we don't do that all the time, and we don't have to do it like that. But man, we are so anchored to this. Why? What, like, what, why, why do we do that? Because it's God's word. God's word. But also, this leads us to our second characteristic. Why do we seek to preach this so faithfully? Because the word of God is effective. The word of God is effective. The the English trans uh, standard version says it this way, the the word is active. The New Living Translation says it this way, it's powerful. It's effective. In other words, the Word of God actually does things. It accomplishes things. It produces things. It delivers on what it promises. Of course, it only does this when the Spirit is active and enables us to understand and to respond to what it says. I say this because we are by nature not open to coming to God's Word. Like, like you would never choose this on your own. You've, you've got to recognize that if there's any hunger in you for God's word, it's the spirit that is at work in you. We need to be gracious, recognizing that the Lord is at work in our lives, that God's spirit enlightens our eyes and our minds and activates our hearts to rejoice in and to receive what God has revealed. Apart from the spirit, the word to us will remain just words that will prove unknowable, confusing, and disheartening. If 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 the spirit is not at work in you and you pick this up and you try to read it, it's just gonna be super frustrating. This is why we pray for the Holy Spirit to, to soften hearts. You know what, I I pray, I pray regularly before I show up here on a Sunday, I go, Holy Spirit, would you take a hold of the hearts of those that are coming here today? Soften them, prepare them. Folks are coming here, wrestling with so much. You're carrying so much from the week before and and, and maybe some of you hardened your heart to God's word. You're no longer listening. You're just like, I want to do my own thing. And so someone will get up here and they, they they will preach and preach and preach and preach and nothing. Holy Spirit's got to take a hold of your heart. So what does the Word of God do when the Spirit of God takes a hold of us? What does the Word of God do when the Spirit of God takes a hold of us? Let me try to explain it this way. See, experts study sociological dynamics and trends in order to set the agenda of how we should do life. This includes the church and the ministries that we do. And now with all due respect to sociology, in 10 years, studies will show that what we used to do is now outdated and ineffective. And through it all, the word of God, through the work of the spirit of God, will have remained true and unchanging and ever powerful, always active and effective. Let let, let me me give you another one. Experts study psychological factors that govern human behavior and provide us with principles for better living and emotional and mental health. I have massive respect for psychology and the work that folks in that profession provide in society. Many of them are in this very room. However, if history is to tell us anything, as little as 10 years from now, new studies and additional research may result in amendments offering different alternatives to offering care and help. And through it all, the word of God, through the power of the spirit of God, will have remained true and unchanging and 
ever powerful, always active and effective. Let me give you one more. Experts study philosophy and political theory and economic trends, community dynamics and principles that govern interpersonal relationships. And with all due respect to the brilliance of such learned individuals and what they do to help us as a, a people to move forward, in 10 years, things will change because of a recession, political instability, a pandemic. And then we will be told to ignore earlier discoveries and to embrace another new theory which will make life better for us. And through it all, the Word of God, by the Spirit of God, will have remained true and unchanging and ever powerful, always active and effective. Oh, now, what are you trying to say? The Word of God is always effective. I hope you see the point I'm making. The Word of God, by the Spirit of God, remains true, unchanging, ever powerful, always active and effective. And so let it anchor your soul. Let it be the rock on which you stand. Let it be the compass to guide you through trials and tribulations, through uncertainty and change. Let it govern your choices and renew your heart and restore your joy and ground your heart. Build your life on its moral principles. Embrace its ethical and moral norms. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm pleading with you. I'm pleading with you. You want, you, you want your life to look different? Read the word and take it as it is. Believe what it says about the nature and the character of God. Believe what it says about the nature and the character of humanity. It has a lot to say about God and it has a lot to say about us. And sometimes we confuse those. We'll step into God's place and go, yeah, yeah, that's us, and then we'll think of God as us. Be careful. The Word of God vibrates with power. It is active and effective. Characteristic number three. The word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. Now, when the writer of Hebrews talks here of soul, spirit, joints and marrow, he's providing us with a, with a, a, a how do I say this, like a, like a, a physiological or, 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 or bodily analysis. Uh, he's trying to kind of uh, communicate something to us by giving us a picture of it. There's a figurative representation in graphic terms of the precise piercing power of God's word. It probes, it investigates, it inquires, it questions, it interrogates, and it exposes the innermost parts of our spiritual being, bringing light to the hidden things. In other words, he could have easily said it pierces to the dividing of heart and mind and emotions and the core of who we are this is why sometimes i don't like to read the word of god let's be honest when you know you you are actively living in sin when you know that you are doing things that you know you shouldn't be god god could have said it over and over again don't do that don't think like that you, you go, you know what, I, I need to stay as far away from God's word because it'll expose me. So what does he mean when he says the word of God is, is sharper than any two-edged sword? Some believe two edges are a reference to the Old Testament and the New Testament. Could be. Others say it's his way of saying that the word speaks of both earthly and eternal matters could be 
Or maybe the point is that the, the word has a, a twofold result. It, it, it can save and it can also judge. I like that one. And not just because I like it, but because if we continue to read God's word, that comes up. See, I think of the word of God like a, both a, a surgical knife and a guillotine. A, a surgical knife in the hands of an expert surgeon who is able to, to cut so delicately and remove things from our body that don't belong there, to remove the cancer in our body that doesn't belong there. He, beautifully and carefully and precise to make us feel better. But the Word of God is also a guillotine invented by the French. I don't know if you guys know what a guillotine is. That device you would lie flat, you put your head through and your arms through and then the thing would come on your neck there and then this blade would simply come and slice your head off. A guillotine. And for those, for those who refuse to repent, for those who refuse to turn away from whatever it is that they're running to, hoping to find life and meaning to, and, and to turn to God, like the word, the word will become like a guillotine in your life. The whole time. The whole time. Your relationships like this. The way you handle money like this. Your ambitions and your goals like this. Where the Lord wants to, wants to, wants to cut. He must have, no, 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 you're heading in the right direction, but let me, let me just remove this because that's not helpful for you. I, I'm loving and kind and, 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 and patient with you. I care for you. I respond to that. The Word of God is always working. It's always working, and it will produce something. Isaiah 55, verse 10 to 11 says this, The rain and snow come down from the heavens and stay on the ground to water the earth. They cause the grain to grow, producing seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. It is the same with my word. I send it out, and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to, and it will prosper wherever I send it. Characteristic number four. We're almost done. The word of God judges or discerns the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Uh-oh. When we read this, we should think of what David said in Psalm 139, verses 1 to 4. Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I stand up. You understand my thoughts from far away. You observe my travels and my rest. You are aware of all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know all about it, Lord. We're really good at pretending and performing, putting on a show for others, but not with God. God is not impressed with your pretending and your performing. God cannot be fooled by facade and hypocrisy. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what you're going to be thinking about later this afternoon, what you're going to be feeling. The word translated here, judging, in verse 12, is meant to communicate to us that the word of God evaluates our thoughts and intentions and then weighs them, analyzes them. So we can say a whole bunch of stuff, but the word of God's going to assess that. The word of God penetrates deeply into the most secret places of our hearts and brings an awareness of what is there, if it's good or bad, if it's sincere or two-faced, if it's honorable or unethical. You can hide from us, but you cannot hide from the Word of God. Yeah. This is how God works through His Word to protect us against sin and temptation. You, you'll remember that in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, the author of Hebrews spoke of the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is deceptive when it digs deeply into our souls and lies to us. Remember, Satan has words too. He is the father of lies, telling us that we are better off 
by sleeping with that person who is not our spouse, ignoring God's word on holiness. He'll tell us that, no, 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 you should accumulate all that you can for yourself because it will make you feel better. He'll tell us it's okay to be a little dishonest to get what you want. He'll tell us, you know what, you are justified in insulting that person because they were trying to get into your way. Our only hope is that we might find something that is powerful enough and sharp enough that it can penetrate through the fog of deception and shed light on my thoughts and intentions and reveal to me the lies that I'm so easily prone to believe. We are, aren't we? It doesn't take too long. You'll show up here on a Sunday, worship, sing, you'll pray, you'll hear God's word, encouraged. You'll walk out of here, you're like, I just can't wait to tackle this week. You make it through Monday, you trip a little bit over Tuesday, by Wednesday you're like, what on earth is going on? And now you've made yourself open to the father of lies because you're no longer coming to the word of God and believing everything that he says. Last characteristic. I'll summarize all of this in this one. The word of God uncovers and exposes the secrets of our souls. That's a big one. Have you ever turned over an old piece of wood that's been lying somewhere for a very long time? When you do, it oftentimes reveals an enormous amount of ants and spiders and all sorts of insects who are all comfortably living in the dark in an undisclosed, damp place. And they don't appreciate it when the light hits them, when it exposes their presence. See, many Christians, many of us, we live lives of secret, covered up in darkness. Some of us live in fear that one day someone will lift up that old piece of wood and that all will be seen. This is why we pretend and perform. It's like, I just, I don't want people to know that because if people knew that about my life. But friends, this is what the word of God does. It exposes, it brings to the surface. It pulls back the curtain on our souls. It lifts the veil on our thoughts and intentions. It shines a light into the darkness of our hearts and forces us to deal honestly with what is hidden deeply within. When the Spirit of God together with the Word of God take a hold of our hearts, our deepest and darkest secrets are brought to the surface and into the light of day. Our conscience is exposed. Our hidden sins are laid bare before God to whom all of us must give account. You don't have to give account to me. You don't. Because I didn't die for you. My my blood, my blood cannot save you. But one day we will all stand before a holy God. We will have to give account to him. Now, now this can all sound overwhelming, right? doesn't feel like a birthday message on air. I was hoping on a happy Mother's Day and boom, in the script, like, what's going on? It's somewhat discouraging. That's how I felt in preparing this message. I was like, wow, this is, this is a lot. But there is good news here. There is good news. There is wonderful news. And that is God's reason in exposing my and your heart in this way isn't so that he can just make a fool of us. It's not so that he can just shame us or hurt us. No, 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 the world does that, right? The world exposes so that it can hurt and embarrass and shame. This is why so often society will define us by what we do instead of who we are. Because then I don't have to deal with who you are. I can just be like, well, 
you're a failure. You're this and that. No, 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 I'm a, I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. He does this not, not to make a fool of us or to, or to hurt us. What God's word does in us is far more than just expose our pride and selfishness and arrogance. Yes, it's convicting. It's convicting. But it is redemptive and healing and empowering. The, the, the word of God doesn't just, it doesn't just move you. It shouldn't. It shouldn't just move you. A Sunday like this shouldn't just move you. Because we're good at that. We're good at moving people with an epic worship experience. Friends, if we had money, maybe we'd put in a smoke machine. No, no, we'll never. We'll never put in a smoke machine. There's, there's many ways that we can be moved. That's not what the Word of God wants to do. The Word of God wants to change you transform you. That's what the Word of God does. And so if you're here and you just go, oh, I got moved. The Word of God wants to do more than that. When we gather here uh, before the gathering, many of us, we, we pray and, and we say, God, would you, would, you, would you transform the folks that come in here this morning? Would they leave here radically changed to how they came in? There are better places to be moved. Way better. You should be part of a community that preaches God's word because it believes that the word of God changes us. And that's what, that's what God wants to do with his word. He, he, it's redemptive, it's, it's healing, and it's empowering. It's renewing. That is what God's word does. That's why I refuse to give you self-help tips. I just won't. That's what you're looking for. You're not going to find them. I refuse to give you 10 steps to make your life better. These things will they'll make you feel good, but they will not lead you to the abundant life. Remember, Jesus didn't come to make your life better. Jesus didn't come to give you an upgrade. That's not what he came to do. It's not like, you know, my life was pretty good. I just, I just need a little bit of Jesus. Now, you know what? Now my life is better. No, your life was horrible. You were separated from God, far from his promises, always trying to turn stones to bread by your own power. And then Jesus comes and lives the life that we should have lived, died the death that all of us deserve, rose from the grave, right now seated at the right hand of the Father because everything that he came to do is finished. In fact, one day he's coming back to make all things new again. We surrender our lives to that. Jesus came to change us to breathe life into our dead bodies and souls. At Rooted Fellowship, we believe this about the Word of God. We don't study it and preach it and memorize it because we want to become biblical scholars. We're not going to get into debates on, on like, well, you know, you know, if you think about this uh, over here, if you, no, 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 we're not doing that here. Does the Word of God matter? Absolutely, absolutely. We study it in its original language. Because we want to understand what was the, the original intent. What was the author trying to say? And, and then God, like just by the power of the Spirit, does something to it so that it, it's, it's like it's just, it works. Every word. Think about it for a moment. Paul, Paul, I don't think Paul was sitting there writing these letters to the churches going, you know what? Like thousands of years from now, like there's a, a, a community called Rooted Fellowship. They're going to open up this word and they're going to say, I need to be like, you know, let me put a comma here. Let me, no, no, no. He, in that moment, he's just going, guys, I need you to understand who God is. And then God sprinkles something on it that, that goes, you know, what? generation after generation after generation, that will remain true. Yeah. We are devoted to God's word because of what it is. It's God's word. And because of what it does, it pierces and divides and discerns and exposes. But especially, we love it because it shows us God. It shows us God. Why, why, do we, why do we love the Word of God? Because it reveals to us God the Father. In, in John 14, verse 8, I'm going to have the band come up as I close here. In John 14, verse 8, Philip, 
Philip asks Jesus something that, that I believe. I, I don't think he knew what he was asking, but, but if you look at it, he's, he's essentially asking what all of us are, are asking for. Show us the Father, and that will be enough. Other translations say it this way. Show us the Father, and we'll be satisfied. You know what the problem is? Is we are not satisfied. Why? Because we've turned away from God the Father. And so we're running to all these other things, hoping that they will satisfy us, that they will be enough, but they're not. They can never be enough. This is why Philip goes, you know what? I think I get it. I think I get it. Show us the Father and that'll be enough. When, when God breathed life into Adam, what was the first thing that Adam saw? What was the... Come, come, come with me, guys. Come with me, right? If, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I'm, there's Adam, here's his face, and I, and I breathe life into his nostrils. And Adam opens his eyes. What's the first thing he sees? The face of God. Adam and Eve sin. We now live in a world of brokenness. And our hearts are longing to see the face of the Father. Show us the Father and that'll be enough. Show us the Father and we will be satisfied. And so the, the, the Word of God reveals to us the Father. It reveals to us the Father. I, I have no idea why we're going to all these other places hoping to find the Father. He's here. From Genesis to Revelation. When we come to God's word, we encounter him. We encounter him through his word. We see him through his word. I mean, Jesus in that, in that moment says, he says, listen, show us the Father. That, like, if, if you see me, you see the Father. One of the many reasons I believe Jesus came is that for, for a long time, I think they just, they weren't, they weren't getting it. They, weren't, they didn't understand. So then, so then, uh, God and, and, and Jesus are going, man, what are we going to do? How can we help them understand what's... And Jesus, you know, let, let me go. Let me go. A and show them what a relationship looks like between a son and a father, a, a child and a father. Like, let, let, me, let me model that, for, and then also let me make a way. Show us the Father, and that'll be enough. God is speaking to us. I've heard some people say that this is God's love letter to his children. He is speaking to us. And so here's what I want to do. We're going to sing in response. Because I want us to be a people who, who read God's word and then do it. Gosh, my prayer for Rooted Fellowship is that we would be, we would be a, a, a people who believe what God says and then that we actually do it. Because there are things in here that we just, like we don't do what, maybe because we're uncomfortable, maybe because of the fear of, like what will people think about us? No, 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 no. If God says it, then we do it. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to, I'm going to read a couple of things to you. They're from God's word and I'm going to give you the address and um, if you want this, I'm happy to give it to you and, and we'll make it available to you. But I just, I just want to read God's word over you. God, would you open up our minds and our ears and our hearts to your word? The longest chapter in the Bible is Psalm 119. 176 verses. What's it about? The word of God. The word of God. So let me, let me read some of these over you. God's word brings true health, fruitfulness, prosperity, and success to what we do. Psalm 1 verse 3. The word of God has healing power and the power to deliver from oppression. Psalm 107 verse 20. Matthew 8 verse 8. Matthew 8 verse 16. God's word cleans us. Psalm 119 verse 9. John 15 verse 3. Ephesians 5 verse 26. The word of God hidden in our hearts keeps us from sin. Psalm 119 verse 11. God's word is a counselor. When we delight in God's word, it becomes a rich source of counsel and guidance to us. Psalm 119 verse 24. God's word is a source of strength. Psalm 119 verse 28. God's words impart life. 
It is a continual source of life. Matthew 4, verse 4. God's word is a source of enlightenment and guidance. When God's word comes in, light comes in. It makes the simple wise and understanding. Psalm 119, 105. God's word gives peace to those who love it. They are secure, standing in a safe place. Psalm 119, verse 165. When the word of God is heard and understood, it bears fruit. Matthew 13, verse 23. The word of God has inherent power and authority against demonic powers. Luke 4, verse 36. Jesus himself, he's eternal person is described as the word when we are into the word of God we are into Jesus John 1 verse 1 hearing God's word is essential to eternal life one cannot pass from death to life unless they hear the word of God John 5 24 James 1 21 1 Peter 1 23 abiding which means living in God's word is evidence of true discipleship John 8, verse 31. God's word is the means to sanctification. John 17, 17. The Holy Spirit can work with great power as the word of God is preached. Acts 10, verse 44. Hearing God's word builds faith. Romans 10, 17. Holding fast to the word of God gives assurance of salvation. 1 Corinthians 15, 2. The faithful handling of the word of God gives those who preach and teach it a clear conscience that they are doing all that they could do before God. 2 Corinthians 4, 2, Philippians 2, 16. The word of God is the sword of the spirit. It is what we need for spiritual battle. Ephesians 6, 17. The word of God comes with the power of the Holy Spirit with full assurance. 1 Thessalonians 1.5 The word of God works effectively in those who believe. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 The word of God sanctifies what we do. 1 Timothy 4.5 And lastly, the word of God is the Christian source of spiritual growth. 1 Peter 2.2 1 Corinthians 2.1-5 everything that you are going through God has something to say about it and so we run to God we run to God believing him and believing his word that he has everything that we need show us the father and that'll be enough and so father God we come now as your children asking that you would do such a powerful work in us Holy Spirit would you awaken us to the power of the word of God. No more should we be running to other things, hoping to find life and meaning. Father, we come to you. It's by your grace that you have not left us to wander on our own and to figure this out, but you have given us your very word that guides and leads. And so today we want to respond in faith and obedience. We want to respond in faith and obedience. And so I pray for those in this very room who have not given their lives to you, have not surrendered to you. Maybe they are aware of who you are and and they're aware of the things that you do, but they don't have a personal relationship with you. I pray now in this moment that they would just lay it all down and say, God, I need you. I need a favor. It is the easiest thing to do. I cannot save myself. My life is filled with my own fingerprints trying to to make sense of it all, trying to control it all, trying to keep it up. God, what I need is your fingerprints on my life. And so I pray the blood of Jesus over them. If that's you this morning, all you simply have to do is say, God, I need you. I've tried to do it on my own, but I need you. And so I surrender my life to you. And then, Lord, I pray for those who have been walking with you for a while. They've said yes to you. They've they've given everything to you. They've said, God, my life is in your hands. Lord, I, I pray. I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
that we would bear much fruit. That we would read your word. Just simply read your word. And then do what it says. Lord, I pray that we would be like the servants at the wedding where Jesus turned water to wine. Where Jesus' mother looks to them and says, do exactly what he says. Father God, I pray that we would be a church that does exactly what you say. Because only when we do that do we find life and life to the full. Only when we do marriage according to the way that you say we should, or do relationships the way that you say we should, handle money in the way that you say we should, serve one another the way you say we should, be in community. The Bible tells us to confess our sins. Lord, I pray that we would be a confessing community. The Bible says that those who are hurting, that they would pray. Would we be a praying community? The Bible says that those who, who are rejoicing, that we would continue to rejoice. Let our singing be, be like our prayers over those who are hurting. All of Scripture is God breathed, profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So that the man of God may be complete and be effective for every good work. And so God, we love you, we praise you, we need you. Help us to respond to your word in faith and obedience. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen.